All right, let's just jump right in, because we're about to talk about something, well, something pretty wild. It's this place where biology and technology meet in the strangest way possible. I'm talking about data storage that has feathers. You know, you save a file to Google Drive, right? We all do it, probably dozens of times a day. And yeah, it's super easy, it's instant. But let's be real, it's kind of boring. It's sterile, it's just digital paperwork. But what if you could do something else? Instead of just dragging that file into some folder that syncs with a server farm miles away, what if you could save it to a bird? Seriously, and no, I'm not talking about tweeting a link. I mean actually encoding a digital file into the brain of a living, breathing animal. That sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie, doesn't it? Well, guess what? It's not science fiction. This actually happened. It was a real experiment. Someone managed to store and then get back a digital file from a bird's memory. It actually worked. Okay, so the big questions are, who would even think of doing something like this? And which bird gets to be the world's very first bio USB stick? Let's get into it. So the guy who pulled this off is Ben Jordan. He's a musician and a YouTuber. And apparently he just had this incredibly weird question pop into his head. And well, he just had to see if he could find the answer. And his partner in crime, the European Starling. Now choosing this bird was absolutely key. See, Starlings are amazing mimics. Their brains are just wired differently. They can learn and copy really complex sounds to hear around them. We're not just talking about other bird songs. I mean, they can mimic car alarms, cell phone ringtones, you name it. They're basically nature's own little feathery voice recorders. All right, so you've got the person, you've got the bird, but how in the world do you connect the two? How do you take a PNG image file from a laptop and, you know, upload it into an animal's brain? The process was, as you can imagine, a mix of some pretty smart engineering and just a ton of patience. Okay, so here's how it went down. Step one, Jordan took an image file, a PNG, and converted it into a very specific sound, an audio waveform. Step two, he played that sound over and over and over again for a baby starling he was raising by hand right when it was in that crucial phase for learning songs. The whole idea was that the bird would just pick it up. Then for weeks, he recorded literally everything the bird chirped. We're talking gigabytes of sound. Step four was the real grind. He had to listen through all of that to find the exact moment the bird copied the sound. And finally, the last step, the big test, could he take that bit of bird song and decode it back into the original picture? So, this is it, right? The moment of truth. After all that effort, the file conversion, the training, listening to hours and hours of chirping, did it work? Was the data actually transferred? And the answer is yes, it worked. After digging through what must have felt like an ocean of bird noise, Jordan found it. Just this tiny little blip in the recording where the starling nailed it. It perfectly copied the sound. The bird literally sang the file back at him. Okay, so was it a perfect copy, like a perfect digital clone? Well, not exactly. The original sound from the computer is super clean, right? The bird's version, it was a little faint, a little messy, kind of like a low quality MP3 or a bootleg recording. But the important part, the core signal, it was definitely there. It was close enough that it could actually be decoded. And if we want to get technical for a second, there was a little bit of distortion. The bird's version was off by about 50 to 60 hertz. So what does that really mean? It just means the retrieval wasn't perfect. It wasn't high fidelity. So yeah, you're probably not gonna trust a Starling with your bank passwords, but the amazing thing is that the basic information made it from the computer into the bird and back out again. Okay, so we know it's possible, it can be done. But before you go out and trade in your solid state drive for a cage full of birds, let's get a little reality check here. How does this bird drive actually compare to the tech we use every day? First up, let's talk speed. So with some good compression, Jordan figured the Starlin could maybe hit about two megabytes per second, which, hey, for a bird, that's incredible. But your modern SSD, that thing is cruising at 500 megabytes per second. That's what, 250 times faster? Yeah, it's, it's not really a competition. And then there are the, let's call them practical limitations. Right, so first, the quality isn't great. We know that. The file's a bit distorted. Second, finding the file meant searching through 200 hours of what you can only call bird karaoke. And then there's the biggest risk factor of all. Your hard drive could literally just fly away. 
Or it could get bored of your file and decide to learn the song of the ice cream truck instead. So, okay, it's not practical, it's slow, it's not super reliable, it's kind of messy. So why are we even talking about it? Why does any of this matter? What makes this more than just a cool party trip? And that's really the whole point. The goal here was never to replace your hard drive. Nobody was trying to invent a new product. You're not gonna see the Starling Stick Pro at Best Buy next year. That was never, ever the idea. What this really was, at its core, was just pure exploration. It was about taking a weird what-if idea and pushing it as far as it could possibly go, just to see what happens. It makes you stop and think, right? It challenges how we think about information and where it can exist and what the word storage even means. And that, I think, is the really beautiful takeaway from all this. It's this amazing kind of poetic reminder that all the stuff we think belongs to computers, things like memory and data and replication, it's not just for silicon chips and circuit boards. Those same processes are happening in the living, breathing world all around us. He showed us that memory and data don't just belong to machines. Sometimes they live in feathers. Which, of course, leaves us with one last fun question to chew on. If you can store a picture in a bird, what's next? What other hidden data storage is out there in the natural world? You think we could store an Excel spreadsheet in a cat? I mean, probably not. But after seeing this, you kind of have